still finding the photos for the album. Someone else should go first. Davey, you're up. All right. Uh, I feel like I'm 100 years old every time I do this, so bear with me while I figure out how to show my pictures to you. Um, how do I... You probably don't see anything I see yet, right? How do I share a screen? There we see go. that at the very top or the very bottom? This should yeah. be a green button that says share screen. Oh, I got you. Okay, hold on a second. And then when you do it, you can say desktop and it'll show anything that's on your desktop versus if you pick a window, then it'll only show the contents of that window no matter what. Oh, okay. So then I want to share this screen. So am I going to create like some weird loop if I do this? No, it should be good. Can you see the a toilet? Uh, can you see my toilet? No. You see your desktop. Yeah, we got your, we got the sun desktop. Okay. Um, your desktop's a little cluttered, buddy. You should work on cleaning that up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you shared your desktop and then uh, just pull up whatever you want to share, it should uh, that should be on top then. Oh, can you see my toilet now? Uh, hang on, it takes a minute. There you go. Yep. Now we got Here, your toilet. Here we go. Oh, this is the All most right, so... beautiful toilet I've ever seen. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to talk about my bathroom project that started, I don't know, 11 months ago and was supposed to take, my wife asked it for it to take three weeks. And um, I told her at best three months and we're now like 10 months in. So anyway, we bought this house, a 1927 house. The bathroom was remodeled in like the 50s and the 90s. Um, it, from what you can see here, that's the original tub. Uh, who knows when that toilet was put in. The white tile was put in probably in the 90s. And the pink tile was in the 50s, and it's plastic pop-off tile or whatever. It's, um, it's just plastic front face tile. And so, as you can see, the bathroom is ugly as sin. Uh, when we bought the house, we, we thought like, ah, oh, $5,000, we'll give it a facelift, we'll have a new bathroom, no big deal. And then as we started specking the job, we're like, oh, okay, $10,000 budget. We'll just we'll move a few things around. And then, I don't know, we're like 13,000 and something right now. So we'll see. Um, good news is I'm almost done buying stuff. So anyway, here's the bathroom as it's set when we bought the place and uh, it was ugly and Sandy kept complaining about it. So we decided to change it. We got uh, Sean's wife, Christy involved who helped us with this design. And as you can see, uh, there's a, sh can you see my mouse, the cursor? Yeah. Okay, so the shower here, we had to scrap this plan because this is like almost $4,000 in shower glass right here. And so that project or that part got changed to this part, which has this shower um, set up with a toilet and a tub and, and all that. Um, and this is what we settled on. And so, I don't know, I tore the tub out and I put it in my bedroom and it stayed there for, I don't know, 10 months or something. And then, from there, we just tore it down, right? So I mean, my brother came over, we put, it was all lath and plaster, so we peel all that off, um, got it down to the studs. I didn't find anything egregious in the walls like I expected to. Normally when you do a remodel project, you find like rot or whatever. Um, I did, however, the floor was completely screwed up and I didn't quite notice this when I first took it all apart. But if you look here, there's some pretty big notches where the plumbing was. And then here where they ran the toilet, the this was the toilet and so, where they ran the soil stack through, they carved this floor joist down to like an inch and a half thick. And it's only a two by eight to start with. Um, and so that's like barely, that's not code now and uh, it's barely enough. Anyway, so I fell through the floor once, or the first time anyway, I fell through the floor twice. Um, that's a story for a different day. And uh, so here's the floor joists that they carved out to run the toilet. As you can see, this part here is a two by four that they nailed to the floor joist to strengthen it or something. And then, um, so basically the floor had sank because of that, because there was no structure and the toilet was leaking and the rotting and they replaced it in the nineties or whatever. And so I had to true up the floor by almost three quarters of an inch. Uh, and then these notches, caused me to have to sister everything in the floor, which this was Sean, Sean helped a lot in this project, uh, especially with uh, orchestra, or, um, giving me tips on what to do. But he actually came over this day and we drove, you can see the hammer hits. This is a 12 and a half foot two by eight that we pounded into the side of my house because they had to go through the bathroom into the load bearing wall on the other side of the hallway to, to hold this weight. And so, um, 
basically, you'll see later on, I basically re-sistered every joist in the floor. If I put any more wood in, it would just be two by eights all the way across. It would just be a solid floor. Um, which that was like the one big gotcha that I wasn't quite planned for or prepared for. So of course, everything had to change. So this new, this plywood here is where the old window was. This is the new shiny window that Sean helped me install and weatherproof and all that. Uh, there's the other window. So um, it's a balloon construction, which caused me some headache because I didn't really know what to do. Uh, fortunately, like I said, Sean's an awesome person and helped me with all that. Uh, this is kind of the plumbing after I got all the floor framed out. Uh, this is all the new plumbing. So I had to run a new soil stack, which is this big four inch job that goes from the attic to the basement. So like a three, a full three stories. And then I had to run a three inch here to capture the toilet and the shower water. And then this is the sink and the tub. And then this is, you know, inbound copper and all that. Uh, this here doesn't match code, but the guy, the code guy couldn't give me a better understanding of what I could do there. So he let it fly. Um, anyway, this whole project has just been learning one thing after the other, or building some jig to build some jig to then do the thing that I want, uh, which is why we're like 11 months in. Um, yeah, this is just some plumbing pictures. So you can see what all I did here. Ran all the copper. Only had like three leaks in all the copper after I ran it, so that was pretty soft, pretty exciting. Um, so why'd you do copper? I I don't know. Old Superstition, school. probably. There, you know, copper, they've, copper's been around for a long, long time. Plastic's only been around for a little bit. So I trust copper more than I trust plastic. That's the short story. Um, so here's the floor. Like I said, it's like basically two by eights all strapped together. Uh, one fun point to note here is that because the house is almost 100 years old, it slopes in like all towards the fireplace. And so this far, I'm standing in the doorway when I took this picture. The far corner is almost two inches higher than this corner at the doorway. The tub sits here and needs to be level. The shower sits behind this door frame here and it needs to be level. And then the rest of it has to slope towards the hallway so that all the floor, you know, I didn't want to put like a two inch step into the bathroom. So, um, uh, and I put this picture back here again so you could see, cause like this tub has, you know, the, there's a slope in the whole room this way. And so this is where this pile of shims came in. I had to custom cut a shim for every floor joist, or three shims for every floor joist. One for the tub, one for you know this middle section, and one for the shower to get everything level. So that was kind of an interesting part. Um, and here you can see where there's like, this is almost, I think this was seven eighths of an inch shim here that tapered back to zero at the wall on the other end. Uh, you can also see where I kind of stabbed together some of the floor joists to fix this up. Um, this was kind of cool. This is after I got the floor set and the vapor barrier on, we got to set the bathtub. And when it came to it, Sean was like, oh, we're going to use your chain hoist to set that tub down. And I just, I honestly, I thought he was a crazy person. Uh, turns out it was a really awesome idea. And because with him and another buddy, we were able to like pick this up and put it down somewhere like 18 times to get all the plumbing to fit and recut stuff and get everything to, to work right. So Elida got a bathtub, uh, a tub that she hadn't gotten in like a year, which she was excited about. Um, I also, because I don't know what I'm doing, bought half inch waterproof curdy board and five eighths inch rock. The five eighths inch rock was free. So like, that's what I'm telling myself. Uh, anyway, so I had to shim everything. There's, this was just shims stacked on top of shims because all the walls had to be shimmed plumb. This exterior wall over here had to be shimmed out by an inch and a half to fit for the plumbing so I can insulate behind it. Um, and then here it is after the orange is all the waterproof, the curdy board. And then, uh, so I installed all this in the shower and everything. And then you have to tape it to make it fully waterproof. And they say this is waterproof up to 10, uh, what is it, 10 stories below sea level. Uh, that much pressure before it will work its way behind it. So here's my shower um, and the curb that I built. And then this is the finished shower pan. So from here, except for like these exposed seams that I taped later, this is now ready for tile. Uh, and this is the whole Schluter kind of system, uh, if anybody cares. And um, pre-global pandemic, my brother is awesome at mud work and convinced me to skim coat the whole bathroom. And then pandemic hit and I couldn't hang out with him. So I had to do this myself. So all of this is just drywall mud. So I put a bucket and a half of mud on the ceiling and on the walls and discovered that I'm actually pretty decent at, at 
skim coating. So that was kind of fun. And this was all in an effort to match the texture of the house, which was all hand troweled um, plaster on lath and then textured afterwards. So I skim coated all the mud to get the waves and then I put sand paint on later and you'll see that in a minute. Uh, and then it was time to do trim. If you ever need to make a window, what we call a window sill is actually called a window stool, I learned. Uh, if you ever need to make one of these, just get all the power tools that you own out and just set them there because you're going to need every one of them. I use just every tool that I own to make this one piece. And then I had to do it again. Uh, so there's, you know, all the notches and all the whatevers. And uh, so there's starting the trim. And then here's a window that is trimmed out, which I'm super excited about. Um, my wife gasped when she saw it, so that was kind of fun. Uh, and then today, so that's kind of where I'm at now. Today, I actually put this down. This is the uncoupling membrane that goes underneath the floor tile. Um, and then this, at this joint here, I will, um, I'll tape with that curdy banding, I'll tape the, this waterproof membrane to the shower and to the walls to kind of create like a waterproof bucket. Although if, you ever spill water here, it's going to end up in the hallway because all this runs downhill. So I don't know how, you know, what I'm winning there. Um, and then this is going to be the tile. We have all, we basically have everything we need except for the shower glass. Uh, I got to wait until I have the final dimension of tile before I can order that. This is what the floor tile will look like. I'll hopefully be starting that pretty soon. Um, as, um, as with probably most of you guys and everybody else that uh, frequents the sector, uh, nothing is off the shelf is the way I want it. And so I've had to modify pretty much everything I've touched. This is the wall tile, the beveled subway tile. Uh, that'll be all the way up five foot down. And then we'll have a chair rail tile on top of that. Um, but back to the modify everything. If you notice the sink that we picked out has one hole. The sink also costs a hundred bucks. Uh, the next cheapest sink is in the hundred, you know, four or $500 or whatever. Uh, so this has one hole in it, and this faucet needs three holes. So the next part of my project is to put one hole here and one hole here. I've started jigging up. I've got a diamond bit. I've talked to Sean and a couple other people. I've gotten all the ideas that I can to hopefully make this work. But I figure if I break one sink, buy a $40 drill bit, and then buy another sink, if the second one goes, then I'm still ahead financially. If the second one breaks, then I just lost like 250 bucks and I have to go buy a, a $300 sink and, and we won't talk about it. Um, anyway, the last, so that's kind of the last steps that I have left. The cardboard mock-up here is my vanity, which my oldest brother uh, promised to make a year ago and uh, gets nervous every time I bring it up. So if I get the bathroom done, then I'll hang this um, sink on two by fours and then I'll build that vanity myself and that'll be kind of the end of it. So uh, I think that's the end of the show. The, the main thing is I'm almost done. I'm pretty excited. Uh, I've learned a lot. Sean is super awesome. And the great part about working uh, all the scrap metal at the sector is I like all that copper you guys saw came from the sector scrap pile. I don't know why people give Chris so much copper, but it worked in my benefit. Um, and that's kind of it. That's what I know. I knew we were cashing in way too light on that copper. Uh, it's just, you know, I could never figure out where it was going. So this, this <laughs> solves a lot of things for me. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, any, any questions? Yeah. I'm, I'm a little surprised by the initial budget. Uh, but I'm, so I'm wondering, do you have like a ballpark breakdown of what, what costs what, or what was most of the cost or you bill in your time at like $2 an hour or. Uh, time is free. My wife has expensive tastes. Um, I have a spreadsheet of everything I've bought. If I figured curious. as much. I just, you know, give me a, give me a ballpark. What's the, what's the 50% cost? Like what's the okay, biggest well, expense? So the big ticket items were all those fixtures. Um, like all the, just the handles and the valves and the fixtures were like $3,000 or something like uh, that. Okay. That, yeah, that's a lot. The shower, all that orange, the waterproofing stuff was in the $700 range. Um, and then the tile was, the floor tile was really expensive at several hundred dollars. It was like, you know, 12 or $14. A, no, it was 20 something a square foot or whatever for the floor <laughs> tile. I kind of quit asking some of the questions because 
Basically, everything you see, Sandy was in charge of. Everything that you don't see, I was in charge of. Um, and then the shower glass, even though the first one was going to be two thousand or four thousand dollars, and we whittled it back, what we ended up with is well, it'll be you know eighteen hundred dollars, I think, for just one fixed like kit that I'll install. I'm not even paying an installer for it. So, and then we also have to get the bathtub resurfaced because. The plan was it looked great until that white saran or that white tile that was in the original bathroom. I didn't realize that they had put that on top of whatever was there and then resurfaced the bathtub in the 90s. And so when I got done or when I you know got the bathtub out, there was like this much exposed original porcelain and then you know the new coating they put on. And since I put it in there the way I installed it the way it's supposed to be. I was either going to have to like fur the wall out another inch to cover that and then also bring the floor up or something because it was on the floor too and anyway so those are a couple of the big ticket items because the, the and, and that bathtub was a cast iron porcelain or uh, enamel or like what what was it made out of yes cast iron with a uh, porcelain enamel those are nice and light and fun to move in old houses right <laughs> yeah Fortunately, my bedroom is has extra room and was a right across the hallway from the bathroom. So I didn't have to like carry it all the way to the basement and back up or whatever. So. You carry it to the basement in little pieces, Davey. That's the trick. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got any other questions? Anybody more or less inspired to do their bathroom? That's the real question. <laughs> I'm wondering what was the decision to make the separate shower and tub? Because with the bathtub, we have to have a bathtub in the house because it's the only bathroom. And that bathtub, because I'm a broad-shouldered, six-foot-tall guy, I just get wrapped up in the um, shower curtain all the time. And it's just a really unfunctional use. And something we learned early on was we have an eight, almost eight-foot square bath, uh, bathroom. And so when we started, we we're like, we got all this space. We could do whatever we want. Uh, Everything in a bathroom needs a wall. So a big square empty bathroom is useless. If you have a long bathroom with a lot of floors, you know, a uh, square foot, that's awesome. So, um, but yeah, basically to make showers is better. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, so did you end up losing space for like closet area? Because don't bathrooms usually need like toiletries and drawers and stuff? Yeah, the vanity is going to cover most of that. We have a um, a closet right outside the bathroom door that'll handle like all that already handles all the towels and stuff. Uh, but yeah, we're kind of curious about that. I put actually, I didn't put a picture in, but I put a bunch of blocking on the wall. Like when you walk in the wall that's just to the um, right, I put an ass load of blocking in there so that I can hang shelves or shower, you know, towel rods and stuff later. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of curious to see how that plays out in the next couple of years. Awesome. Thanks, Davey. Yeah. Sure, you good? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's share screen. All right. This is my garden project. And um, so basically, uh, garden project started the, the minute that I knew the pandemic would mean that we were not coming back to campus, like something in my brain was like, you should grow food. Um, and then, you know, I thought about it, I'm like, you're not, you're not growing, like, you're not growing that much food, though. Uh, and, but it reminded me that I had really wanted to build a garden a couple years back, uh, maybe like 2013, I had really gotten into it and I made a whole spreadsheet. And it didn't, you know, I didn't have the time or the resources at the point, you know, at that point, so I just kind of tabled the idea. But I really, really wanted to do it. And I was feeling really, I was in a weird place with the pandemic, because for the first time in a really long time, I had all this extra time, because you know, the makerspace, any makerspace is like this giant time sink. Uh, it, it's, it was this last year has been insane. And suddenly there's just this big moment where I could do anything. And I was like, I'm, I'm making a garden. It's a, it was a little manic. Um, but, you know, I, I went online and I did some research and I was like, what do I want it to look like? And, and maybe it's important to point out, I don't own this home, but we, I did email my landlord and they're like, you want to make a, a, a stone seating area and some raised beds? Go right ahead. So I was like, I'm doing it. And I found out that there's a quarry nearby 
uh, and I found out that they will deliver from 45 minutes away. And I like really like the way stone looks. And I was just like, this is like, yeah, it's a little weird. I know people won't get it, but it feels like this is like the only opportunity I'll have in the next five years to do this. So I had the robot. The robot is uh, what you see here. And it's got one of the potted plants that I had uh, from my house. Then I take it to campus so that it could get better light and my cats were eating it. And then I had to bring it back because no one was gonna water it uh, as campus is closed. And then I brought the robot with because they could haul things with the robot. Uh, and it's just an old student project that no one was doing anything with. So I went to Home Depot and I bought a cart and uh, we took it down to the local farm supply store and we tested, we bought a little bit of rock just to see what it would be like uh, and to see how the robot would perform in hauling that rock. And I piled it up kind of, we put just together some like arch with some sticks. And I was like, I like the look of this rock, but obviously at the farm supply store prices, I'm not buying very much of it. And the robot takes forever to get it here. Uh, so that's when I started to look into the court, local quarry. And um, that's when I also, I ordered some supplies for the catio, which is a you know enclosed patio for cats. And Home Depot got so confused. They thought that these were sold by bundles of 12, but they're actually sold by one. So for everything I ordered, they gave me like either, depending on which product, six or 12 times uh, what I wanted, uh, which I still have tons of wood now and you know, the two by twos and one by fours and everything just, you know, extra. And then I just like bit the, you know, I, I just went for it. I just uh, said, let's just, let's just order a truckload because at the time I was thinking this, I made a calculation, a stone is very heavy and I knew how much I would need for about two and then I thought I better get some extra because I also want to make a little path and play around with it. And then I forgot the uh, 2,000 pounds into a ton, not 1,000 pounds to a ton. So we ended up with a bit of a factor of too many. Uh, <laughs> and this is the size of it, more or less. Um, it was very heavy when it arrived. The neighbors thought that the truck had, like, there's the sound of it was so loud. They ran outside to see. And some lady, before the truck even started working, came and took a picture of it. And I, and I immediately went into this mode of like, oh, my God, what have I done? Uh, everyone's going to judge me. No one's going to let me live this down. It's stupid. And now I have to, I have to move it all. And also, um, almost immediately, uh, Scott hurt, you know, he's always had a sh shoulder problem, but he, you know, he wrenched it, uh, on something else on moving a table downstairs. And so I was alone to do this. Uh, but I don't like giving up. Um, so I started moving the stone, uh, and you know, it was, it was really grueling, but I didn't really mind that. I just kept worrying. Like people think I'm crazy, but I felt like the only way to make people see what the vision was, because uh, this is really what this represents for me, right? It's like a chance to work in a new medium, a chance to work in a new scale, a chance to do something that most of my time in my life I haven't had any time to do, uh, a chance to spend time outdoors, and a, a rough draft for like what, if I ever buy a house, like I have some very grand visions of a very, per, you know, customized uh, Victorian conservatory type of uh, mixed garden food forest thing. So, you know, I was like, all right, let's, let's just, let's just do this. Um, so I would haul, I would pick the rocks I liked and I would stack them up, uh, some on the robot for the traction and some on the cart without the sides on it. And then I would uh, dump them out and then we had some snow. And I was like, wow, stone is really beautiful. Like it really, I just, I just like the way it looks. Uh, it's got like this rust color in it when it rains. It's, it's, it's actually a really nice medium. Uh, and I would charge a robot in the basement and to get the robot in and out of the basement, uh, Scott runs the remote control and I just grab the front bumper and I pull it up the stairs or on the way down, I push on it so it doesn't tumble over. Uh, but it's really torquey, really slow, really torquey, but it gets up the basement stairs, which are very poorly built and very uneven and very old. So very much too steep for normal code compliant stairs. Um, and I just kept going. And there was a day where like, I just, I hated everything and I tore half of it down and redid it because it wasn't flat enough, you know? Uh, but we got through all that and the pile started to get smaller. Uh, and I had all these seed starts indoors that were starting to get bigger. Um, and I really wanted to get to that point where I could plant it. Um, and we're getting closer to that. I think this is, if we look at the info, uh, we are now in, I gotta move this uh, panel. What does it say here? April 2nd. So I was like, ah, oh, I really need to plant because the growing season is short here. Uh, and I finally got that first side done and it was like nice and flat and I tilled it and I needed to get more soil. And a friend of mine had ordered too much soil because it's hard to estimate. Uh -huh. So I was going back and forth to the local, uh, to the other city, like, which is like 10 minutes away and, and taking my two door car and filling up a bunch of Sterilite totes with soil and then coming back. Uh, and so I, I started to mulch some things in there and, and aerate it and digging is hard work. Um, and I guess over this time, like things actually got easier because I started to get a lot stronger and now actually, I, I, I actually, the stones that I had given up on and left in place in the beginning, because I'm like, I have no clue how we're going to move those. I can move, I can 
tilt them onto the robot cart myself now, um, which is really interesting. Um, I did not think that would happen. Uh, some of them are really big. Uh, so yeah, so finally around uh, early April, I was able to get this uh, right-hand side one filled and, and then also planted. And then the arch, right? So the arch, if you look at it here, it was sad. That's a sad arch. <laughs> at that point, I was like, that arch is not going to work for me. So Scott's contribution was he redid the arch, uh, larger arch. So more grand. And then, of course, there's a groundhog. We know that there's a groundhog. It's always been there. And we uh, we, we believe in what, everything that Kate t tells us about groundhogs. You shouldn't trap them. Uh, you're just going to get a new groundhog. It's very cruel. So we installed these like great little units, which are passive infrared uh, or like motion detecting infrared. And, and uh, basically, they shoot water. Uh, and the groundhog, it actually has been working because I see him every day. And he's only bitten a couple of broccoli leaves off. Uh, and the rabbits and the, and the cat, the uh, cat from the neighbor's house doesn't, um, doesn't hang out in the garden. It doesn't get the chipmunks and it doesn't get the squirrels. So I won't have any strawberries, but that's okay. Um, and so somewhere around, I think uh, late April, I was finally able to also get some of the work done on the catio. Um, Scott was in charge of that part. Uh, I identified the basic design elements and then he put together the thing and then I went back and corrected some things. We, we, there was no middle bar in the beginning and I was like, that's Boeing. So we went back and then uh, we, we hand cut all of these with a little pull saw uh, because we didn't want to go to the makerspace because it didn't really feel right to break my employer's rules about, you know, lockdown just to go cut something. So learn how to use some hand tools at home. Uh, you know, got that soil and the sterilites, kept going back to Northampton. I'm sure it would have been cheaper from, for gas to just order someone to deliver soil, but I was like, you know, help my friends out with their driveway full of soil. And I started to use, to build a path, uh, which was really fun. And at this point, like I had developed all these techniques, you know, that I didn't have in the beginning. The stone is soft, so I can grab like this pinch bar and just like hit it a bunch to shape it. Uh, and other, other techniques I have for like kind of leveling things out. And they're all very basic, but it was fun to watch how like the process developed. Um, and this is like a view from above. So I started to have this idea for a path to, to tie it all together. And eventually there'll be a second arch maybe next year um, to help like kind of have some thematic elements that are repeated in a third. I'm calling it like the, the lima bean or like the, the kidney, the egg and the pickle. Um, but these like organic shapes. Um, and I grabbed some like, you know, mulch from the garden and just mulched it into all these beds. And then this is the catio getting kind of closer to being done. It needs some painting and some decorating uh, and some hooks, but the cats immediately love it. And we hang out there every morning now. Um, and uh, the sprinkler system, oh yeah, the gloves. So the gloves, uh, I went through a lot of gloves. I, I think I went through uh, for leather gloves, almost everyone would ha develop small holes within like the first work session and would develop huge holes at which point I had to throw them away within a couple of work sessions. And then I switched to the nitrile coated ones and those last a little longer, but they also um, develop holes. They just, they're sold in bulk packs and they're cheaper. Uh, and then I, I after like <laughs> bothering Scott about this for a week, I was like, we have to put in 45 degree. Like, I just don't, I'm, this is not, uh, it's not gonna hold up and be level or even slightly off level at the water uh, drain off if we don't put in these supports. So we put in the supports, and we're still kind of redoing this latch system for the door to make it a little bit more easy and convenient, but cat proof because one of our cats is a little too smart. Um, and the path is kind of coming together. Um, the, the, the slope here is really steep. So I had some ideas for, you know, how I can step down appropriately. I don't want to make anything that's too, you know, slippery in winter. Um, and I'm still kind of working through that part. Um, and, and it's just a really nice place. Um, a couple of things that we really like about it, uh, there's a rhododendron that is just in front of the house and it provides a very picturesque view and there's bees everywhere. They love to hang out and they're gonna pollinate my squash flowers so I don't do it by hand. Uh, and I, got, I started to get radishes and lettuce out of it. Uh, just this month, I've been eating a couple of radishes and lettuce leaves every day from the garden, which feels really great because I've never, I've never done this before. Um, and I planted, um, I think, I think, okay, so I, I counted how many full hours of sunlight I get. I got four full hours, like, you know, full sun from one o'clock to, you know, about noon to, to four, maybe a little bit less. Um, and that's probably going to make this more of a, um, a brassica family plant veggie garden and not so much a corn garden, which is okay. Um, and uh, the robins and the blue jays, they really like to hang out on top of the arch. And, and that what they really want is they want nesting material. So they try to pick the string. Um, but that's fun. And then this is a volunteer potato. So I didn't know what it was. I'm pretty sure it's a potato. I've been composting into the garden and that's really fun when I didn't have to do anything and boom, a potato. Um, and this is just a sandwich with some lettuce that I made. 
uh, and this is the view from the second story. And you can see this is about where it was uh, last weekend. And I'm almost done with that last layer. Then I have to aerate the soil, find more soil, fill it, and put all the rest of my sad leggy seedlings in there. Uh, the rest of the stones will make this little arch from the middle under the arch, sorry, make this little path from the arch uh, around to the other side. And then over in the corner, there's a, a blackberry thicket. And um, that was where the neighbors tried to put in a garden last year, but it wasn't, uh, th there's way too much shade. So that area is just gonna be a little seating area and it's how I'm gonna absorb all those really, really large rocks that are just like insanely big and I'm not gonna be able to use them for anything else. And that's, uh, that's the garden, it was fun. Uh, I learned a lot and you know, if I ever buy a house, I'll do it differently next time. But I think uh, I'm gonna enjoy this one for the good five years to come. And I'm gonna engrave into one of the stones. I'm gonna find out how you can get a stone engraved. It's gonna say like pandemic garden 2020 with like a quote. And uh, I'm hoping that when I'm hundred years old and I come back to like Amherst College, you know, the historic liberal arts college. Uh, and this is one of their properties. I'll be able to be like, I built that back in the pandemic. You know, like the way that we might like treat a 1918 Spanish flu survivor. Uh, today, I wanna be like that crazy lady who uh, built a, a victory garden. Uh, so yeah. That's that. I'll take any questions you got. What kind of rock? So this is called Goshen stone. I think it's after the town of Goshen. I don't know enough about rocks to tell you like the composition. Okay. Uh, it's very soft. It, it has like uh, layers to it and it flakes a little bit. If you, I mean, it's, it's rock, so it's not that soft, but if you drop it from a very tall height, it might crack along a layer line. But, but is it, is it Massachusetts based? Or is yes. It yeah. It's, it's 40 minutes away. Like the dump truck, took 40 minutes to get from there where they took the stone to here so i like that that's kind of local because like with wisconsin there's like the baraboo dolomite that's a classic rock type so yeah i think my house like this the what that i'm living in uh, i looked at the foundation of the basement and it looked really similar so i think that these are all the same type of rock in this area okay which way's north you have oh go ahead jeff uh, just which way's north Oh, uh, this is like this direction is south. If I'm trying to orient myself, this is a, like a south-facing window, but not exactly oriented. So north is the other side of the house. Okay. So like the sun goes across the arch, um, and I'm getting, I'm either mirror imaging it or not, <laughs> in my head. How much was all that rock? Out of curiosity. So because the dump truck cost was a fair amount of, uh, I think it was like. Two hundred dollars for the dump truck. The rock was the rocks and the dump truck together were one thousand eight hundred dollars, and that was like that was all twenty tons and and the cost of, of delivery. So I think um, it's seventy five dollars a ton if you don't pick the stones yourself. And I don't exactly know if they when they fill the dump truck. I, I can't promise you how accurately they weigh it. You know, it I, they just they just fill it. I think, but they know that there's some. I don't know the variance on dump truck loads of, of stone. Usually they uh, they charge you like the truck gets there and you write a check for it and it's whatever they loaded. So like they didn't, they never unload the truck. They just dump it in and then whatever you got is what you got for weight and they just charge it by weight. At least that's how they sell gravel and other stone. Um, so yeah, that that may have been included, but yeah, um, it was one thousand eight hundred dollars. Cool. And I moved all of it by the way. Like there's like uh, maybe like three or four robot loads um, like left to scattered around, but it's, it's, this is all, it's all been at least once moved across the garden. Sure, was it just a picture or did the rock change color from when you got it to now? It changes color based on, on humidity uh, or like how wet it is. So if it would rain right now, all of it would become dark gray and then uh, it becomes a lighter gray. It's also covered in a fine pulverized dust <laughs> uh, right now, which will over time kind of get washed away. So I, uh, I have to say I 100% understand uh, what goes through your head when the dump truck shows up and then like backs up and then dumps out a massive pile of material that you had no idea what you've bought and what you've wrought upon yourself. And when the realization sets in that you are now responsible for figuring out what the hell to do with that huge pile of stuff because it's not going away and nothing else is going to change. So yeah, when the, when the first load of steel showed up at the new building, and then I realized that it was one of three loads of steel. And I realized that the steel would not fit anywhere besides right where it came off the truck. And even at that was going to be a hell of a lot of work to just get it in the building. Uh, did we start to realize kind of what we were getting ourselves into? Because 
on paper, like same thing for here, like 20 tons of stone. Oh, it's like a dump truck. Well, like a dump truck's like a truck full of rock. That all makes sense. And you look at a rock and you're like, well, rocks are really heavy. So it can't be that many rocks. And then you get the rocks and you're like, oh, fuck. It's a lot of rock. Oh. And I, I definitely didn't understand the gradient of the sizes uh, because there is a big gradient and the largest stones are like well over 25 inches, you know, in, in, on any, and like four inches thick. And the smallest stones are any size. Like I can find some that are, you know, I, I can crush them, right? So I didn't really understand what the gradient would look like. And I didn't understand that how large some of them would be. Yeah, what's what's interesting with your picture is it took me a minute and then I realized that your wagon trailer is up at the top right corner. Yes, I've there it is. I noticed that the, you get a sense of scale of like, that's the wagon. Wagons are pretty yeah. good size. This and, is a five uh, gallon bucket. Yeah, it looks like a little tiny like set of, you know, thimble size containers, but those are all huge and everything is very big. So yeah, it's wild. I did feel a little better. Uh, two things made me feel better. Because I, I did feel like maybe people think I'm totally manic and crazy. And, you know, uh, and I can't hide this project. My other projects, like, people are like, that's so cute. But I can put them in a box at the end of the day. And people don't think, you know what I mean? But this one, really, it's like a bit of a, you know, you can't hide it. So the neighbors uh, across the street are, they, they wanted to install a pool. That was their pandemic project. And they were going to do a portion of it themselves and at some point it became too big so they hired some people but I was like you know what your project is bigger uh, and then uh, that made me feel better and I saw a couple people on reddit with some really crazy garden projects uh, one person installed 11 uh, raised beds on a hill and all the commenters were like you're never going to be able to do all the upkeep and I'm like but he built them so like I think if he built them on his own he could probably do the upkeep uh, and, and seeing examples of other people's crazy large projects like your like your bathroom project Davier, like I love I love that because I, I'm like okay I'm not crazy like people do these things they, they, they invest time in things and, and it's actually because um, I just feel like there's a large community of people who are like that's not for me and if that's everyone you meet all day you feel a little alienated like am I the only person who does crazy projects like I don't like that feeling so I really love these sector meetings because I, I love to see what you guys are up to uh, so, I really do look to those for support. This is Mark. Is so. This is all this property, which is now is owned by the university. Yeah, uh, the college, the college, the okay, Amherst the college. College. Okay, so you've yeah, so that's you've you've increased the infrastructure of the university. That's a that's a it's a good thing. I think there's also a chance that this means it won't be as likely to be torn down because, in other words, um, it becomes part of like the historic. Like they they like they keep these like. Uh, photographs and stuff over time like they have this article about some playwrights and opera professors who like wrote a play in this house and so like it becomes part of the history of the thing plus because it's a mostly renters uh nobody ever gets to like do a big like tear down um of anything so i think this might mean that it's more likely to be here in 100 years to get that burrito <laughs> yeah so, I, I I and can't believe that, they let you do that. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, the, the reality of faculty housing is it's to make the faculty happy. And they didn't want to come see anything during the pandemic. So they're like, you can build raised garden beds and a, a stone uh, seating area. So they didn't define it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing is, like, it's also like there's no there's there's a lot of differences between um, the, there's no like individual person. Right. There's not it's, it's, it's an entity that's a group of people. And one of those people is hired to keep like essentially the faculty happy and make sure that there's like, mostly it's about games with the waiting list order. People get upset about like what order they are in the waiting list uh, when, when it comes up for like the lottery for getting into this. And that's their main job is just to keep people not complaining about that they wanted to be higher on the waiting list. So as somebody that struggles with self doubt on a regular basis, uh, I would bet $2 that your neighbors are wholly impressed with this project. I. I put money down that nobody's looking at this like, what the fuck is this crazy lady doing? I bet everybody is like, holy shit, that lady knows what she's doing. And I think they, they like how it looks, but they still have that first thought. Like, they, they think it's crazy, but they, like, they don't think it's ugly. Um, you know, like, like I, I'm sure a lot of you have gotten this feeling, but you, you meet a lot of people and they're like, this person is a little overwhelming and a lot, you know, to deal with. Uh, and it works in a lot of settings, but like, uh, you know, it was like that video of that kindergarten teacher on Reddit the other day where people are like, man, she seems exhausting. Yep, but that's what the kids want to see. Uh, you know, so it, it works sometimes, but it, it is like a little alienating sometimes. So this garden has really shown me a lot about that. That's really been actually the more, the more difficult part than moving all the stone. Um, but I, I think I'm just, you know, I, I'm kind of going to write all of that off. To, it's the pandemic. So just like, <laughs> let's try new things, I guess. How many fingers got smashed? 
Yeah, so actually in the beginning, there was one finger that kept wanting to be the same length. You know, this one kept wanting to be as, as these, this length. Uh, <laughs> uh, but now I've just gotten to the point where that little part of my nail has grown out and it, you can't see it anymore. Uh, and I've gotten better at it since the gloves really matter. It's like the gloves are too long and then they get pinched. Yeah, it's uh, it's weird getting used to working with stone. I did landscaping when I was younger, and um, you get your first day, no matter what, you just get your finger smashed really good, and then you realize like you need to be less smashing your fingers all the time, and then you don't do it as much. But the, the, most, the the worst thing I, I always do is I pivot the stone. I should never pivot the stone. That is how I pinch my fingers. So where's the uh, seating? Yeah, it's hard to see. There's a wooden chair right here in the corner. Uh, yeah. And it's like there's going to be a big swath of grass. This is all just buffer, which I'm killing that grass, but I try to move them pretty quickly. Um, and the, nobody's dealt with the grass here for years. Like they've, they've neglected it for a really long time. Um, so there's going to be a really big swath of grass. I might throw some clover and grass seed on it. Um, and then a little corner here by the blackberry bushes, um, which I'm really sad about because yesterday they, the monthly maintenance guy showed up and ran the John Deere into all the blackberry bushes because they were in the way, but whatever. Uh, yeah, so there's a little corner, just right here. Are you building You're it black. into the stonework at all? Say again? Uh, are you building it into the stonework at all? Like those yeah. along the edge too? So, uh, no, I'm not gonna do a, a perimeter, um, but right here in this area under the chair are a handful of really, really large stones, flat stones that I'm already placing um, that are more or less level. I need to readdress some of the issues there, but uh, that's going to be, right, it's just like essentially all the stone I have left after the path becomes part of the seating area, but I'm not going to do a perimeter. You're putting benches in an area as the seating oh, area? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a fire pit that the neighbors have, uh, and you know, it's all portable furniture and stuff, but we're going to put that on top and do a, a 4th of July barbecue or something. Do you know what's stronger than a John Deere? No. One rock hidden amongst the blackberries. <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to keep them out of the way of the machine. So when you normally when you do like a walkway out of stone, you are uh, not normally, but one way to do it anyway, is you dig down at several inches and then put like a sand or a pea gravel bed down. Uh, have you thought about that for like your big flat walkway or your big kind of patio to make it flatter? Yeah, so I, I talked to my neighbor who's a um, uh, landscaper, um, and he designs a bunch of projects. Um, and he was like, yeah, if you want to do it right, you would put gravel down. Um, but based on, at least the, for the walls, he, he kind of was like, I don't think those are going to shift within like three to four years that much. For the floor, I was definitely a little bit worried, but I mean, the soil is very compacted, and to avoid having the runoff push it down the slope, I built the garden wall uh, as kind of a retaining wall for the um, for the path wall. Uh, sorry, yeah, for the path, and then filling this with soil. My hope is that I won't see too much um, bending or like you know like the all the the rocks doing this after the winter. Um, but if they do that, it's not a huge deal for me to address it next year. I think I'm going to be stuck here for a while. I'm just waiting for all the property values to tank and then I'll have to, you know, that'll buy a house. Uh, but I think I got a little bit, I think this one's got legs, unfortunately. It's going to be a 10-year recession. So uh, I got time to address the gravel issue. The biggest thing with the sand base and the gravel is actually, uh, it just makes it faster to install. So like mm. in your case, I'm sure you're hand leveling soil underneath each stone, basically, which takes a lot of time. But yeah. and you can totally do that. It'll stay flat. It's just that by putting a sand base in, you can just mash the stone into the sand and flatten it. But if you're hand leveling all of them anyways, it doesn't really make any difference what your base is because you're still, as long as you get soil underneath it, it'll stay. The last thing I'm doing is I'm, I'm planting the edges to try to keep water. Um, so I'm like taking the sod pieces and the clover that I'm finding and I'm just like packing it in, in here and it kind of looks nice. Uh, and I'm hoping the root structure keeps everything kind of more or less where it is. So Shira, speaking of roots, did you put down landscape cloth uh, against the wall before you put in the dirt? Or... No, um, I'm weeding by hand. Um, there, you know, there's a lot of obviously weeds coming in from everywhere, but it hasn't been prohibitively difficult. Is the landscaping cloth about about weeds or about water? Well, I'm just thinking sometimes you put it against a wall to keep uh, too much dirt from washing into the wall. Oh yeah, um, the the dirt's not washing in or out actually. I've been watching it. Um, I wanted good drainage because we get a lot of rain here, and uh, the the soil is very clayey, and um, you know, I can't. Like even the soil I got from my friends, it's even with soil builder, it's just it's way too much clay. 
So uh, I've been mulching a lot and I haven't noticed uh, drainage out the holes of soil. Big sheets of cardboard down before you put dirt in that last garden will help also for like the weeding. Yeah, um, I think part of it is also that the soil I'm getting from my friend's house is full of seeds. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best kind of soil. Pre, yeah, it's pre-planted, yeah. that's all. I mean, I actually really enjoy weeding. Uh, it's really not that bad. I like to see that. I actually wanted to create a miniature garden of just what are the different kinds of weeds that I find in my garden, since there's actually quite a few. Weeds are just misplaced plants or awkward tasting lettuce, one of the two. <laughs> Anybody have any other, any yeah, other I'm just questions? Press end. Just stop share. All right. Um, does anybody else have anything else to share? Because that's those are the only two that I know of. I think you promised was, me the uh, other day that you had a presentation coming. Me? Well, you know, I was thinking about doing that, and then I got busy doing some other things today, so it didn't uh -huh. didn't work out. I was actually going to fire up the insulation blower and find out if it works. So I figured Scott would love that, but um, yeah, I was I got close, but instead I put fans in the two uh, floor cutouts on the. Um, where the stairwells are so I can suck air up one half of the building and blow air down the other half of the building so I can try to keep the upstairs cooler so I can work up there uh, more efficiently so because when it gets to be 90 and like 90 percent humidity it's not not great upstairs even though the air conditioning is happy downstairs but obviously the the winter time we get a nice gain because all the heat goes up but the summertime we get a nice uh, load upstairs so you can't get the air conditioning up there so you get there so you're just oh, I actually have a question for you Chris yeah Imagine for a minute that your uh, makerspace was in an uh, uninsulated metal warehouse that you weren't really allowed to go to for a while and was uh, window AC units only that you don't know the state of. What would you do to your saw stop table saw to keep it from rusting? Oh, you know what you can do actually is just coat it. There's a, um, there is a, well, the stupid ones is grease it if you want to. But the, the other one is they sell a aerosol um, machinery storage coating. It's, uh, it looks like silver paint kind of that it goes on, but it just flakes or scrapes right off. And they do that for machinery storage for even outdoors. Um, they'll take giant pieces of cast iron and just hose them down to this stuff and it, it just stays stuck. It's kind of like when you get something from China and they had to prevent it from rusting in the shipping container, which is coated in grease. Um, yeah, you could skim coat it with grease. Uh, WD-40 works fine too, as long as there's no active water on it, which there wouldn't be. Um, you could just hose, just hose everything down with a liberal coat of WD-40 or any kind of lubricating oil. And as long as it doesn't run off or wash off, uh, it'll suck up the dust and keep the humidity off the surface. But yeah, any, that's what sucks is anything at all that doesn't have air conditioning on it uh, will rust like crazy um, just, just from the humidity. What's worse is when humans get hot and they sweat all over stuff. There are some people who, who sweat is really, really, really uh, rust promoting and others who don't promote rust at all. It's really a weird thing, but it's something I've totally noticed depending on who uses the equipment. Um, some people will make it rust way more than others do. Name names. That, no, yeah, that's what I was gonna ask too, I'm yes. I'm not naming names. I have fingerprints. I have fingerprints <laughs> on, the on the table so I can see yep. who it is. No, that's what's crazy is you'll be able to actually literally see where one person puts their hand down and like flash rust of their handprint by the next day. And another person, you know, you can work on it all day long and there won't be a mark at all. It's, it's just a weird thing. So you're it's, saying in their sweat, there is some sort of like, <laughs> uh, I'm sure it's salt, salt, yeah, it has to be salt. Or, something. or oil the water or who knows what. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, it has to do with their pH level too. Right. right. But at any rate, it's, it's just that the reality is people make their certain things rust more than others. So I don't know. But, but yeah, yes, it's the carnivores that are causing the rest. Oh God, vegetarians aren't a problem. <laughs> Did uh, Casey disappeared? He had something he wanted to share. I'll, have to, I'll text him and see if he's still uh, coming back or not. Mark, you want to tell everybody what you're up to? No, well, I think I talked about it earlier. So I did, out of interest for you know, the downside of the the, the pandemic, as Shara said. Um, I figured I've counted the cracks for a while and that's what I'm out doing for a living. But, uh, at some point way back, I did public health, um, back when I was, I actually was, was a faculty for Johns Hopkins medical, medical school. That was my title. Cause that's the only way they gave me the right insurance. 
So I wish I kept my ID card, but I figured maybe with these jobs that are chasing uh, the, the contact tracing, I did, I promoted a couple of my daughters to take the class and I had someone else take it. So I found time in the end of the, 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 the pandemic to sit through a Coursera course, um, which was done by Johns Hopkins. And for me that I was in the first classes that those guys started, which was Daphne Kohler. Do you know these people, Shira? I think it's Daphne Kohler and uh, Daniel Ng, NG, that started. They were front end, and that has been a thing. They, in a couple articles now, uh, everybody drink, it's education, um, <laughs> about during this, during this uh, pandemic, how much more people are using this. It's a really, they've partnered with uh, mostly universities, so it's all over the world and whatever else. And so uh, to see how that, that app has kind of, or that, that organization has grown, whatever else. People are giving away degrees, Georgia Keck at a master's level, but there are, you can still, I, I think you can still take most of the knowledge for free. So you don't, I think you can take most of the classes as long as you don't want to be tested or whatever else, it's there. And so this one piqued my interest because it was Johns Hopkins and that someone was going to pay the 49 bucks. And then I actually finished. And I'd learned a thing or two, um, and uh, I'm hopeful. I, I know Chris was talking, you know, when I saw that, uh, in fact, uh, I'm waiting on um, Fauci. You know, I'm thinking he's going to, or, or something like that, someone's going to deliver a vaccine sooner. My daughters think that treatment is more important. Um, but I'm on the edge of, you know, the, of, of the, the bad demographic. Um, but the, the, the COVID thing in terms of like the, 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 the testing and the, the non, uh, the, the, the level of stuff we did in Tanzania was it was a disease that wasn't going to kill you. It was going to make you blind over a long, long time. And I just remember how fastidious working with epidemiologists were. I, and the, the only tip that I can give you from that is if you have, what I remember for these folk who have just now retired from Johns Hopkins is if you can ever drink with an epidemic, with a with a an entomologist, drink with them because they're the most entertaining people in the world. Uh, and the other one is because when the folk left from Africa, they came back and did uh, public health, and this, they've gone back and forth over time. That they did some uh, senior citizen stuff, so some some aging stuff. And the other, again, these folk have just retired, uh, and they said, "It's what did you learn from your five years of like actually putting people on shake tables and." doing crazy stuff to old people is it's a bitch to get old, but it's really a bitch to be old and poor. <laughs> and so I'm heading towards the end of that. So that, and, and that was, and so these folk have now, they're about 65, semi-retired. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a little bit on contact with them, but I see this sense of the contact tracing not happening, right? And, 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 and so it was interesting to see, it was a pretty well done course. It's worth the listen purely because of the way it's produced and it, you know, and it's, I think New York is using it as you have to take this course as like their pre-training. So they've got another layer on the Coursera that they time you um, and DC I think was doing the same. So I don't know what they've trained, but I don't get a good sense that people are being contact traced, especially after the last couple of weeks. So maybe there's still, a, I think it's in Illinois or in Wisconsin, it's 20 bucks an hour to work from home. Um, and it was the, the, the interview skills that they did were, they were well done, those videos. So that was, and I passed. So. Well, that's not saying a lot for, you know, my, my confidence in contact tracers, Mark, but. No, well, that's, yeah, they didn't, yeah, I passed the. <laughs> they'll let anybody but, through, clearly, but. I can so say, yeah, well, it, it's the, I, 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 the last thing I did before I started teaching was uh, American Express follow-up. And it was so mechanical. They were, they realized, you know, and it basically they're poo-pooing a lot of the context of the, the technology in there, because really this is old tried and true. You know, I know it from TB, you know it from HIV, you know, so these people are like, no, it's done by humans. And you could tell their training was teaching people that had a script, but you were, you were trying to talk to humans. And that's what I thought that their training was, you know, that watching that was, that was well done. So. We'll, so we'll see whether I get the application in or not. But So next year, we're probably going to be a lot of remote online learning. Um, I suspect a lot of our students are actually going to, uh, you know, end up doing uh, either community college or just taking a gap year to study online. And Mark, I know you're a big fan of 
all the MOOCs um, and you have the names, the list of like the really good organizations and individual YouTubers out there, maybe you should compile like a, a suggestion list for somebody looking to get into the world of learning online. Yeah, well, actually, I will send this to Shira. Some of the starter, I mean, it, it is my wife's in the same boat. So my wife's college is College of Natural Resources. Their brand is to pe send people into the woods for six weeks. That's what they have over everybody else. And they're not going to the woods. They're coming to campus and they, you know, they're going to be looking at trees and whatever else. And it's their early run. People are scrambling with what they're yep. going to do. And I've got kids doing the same, figuring out what they're going to do. So, um, but I will send you something to share. These, uh, some of these people that are innovating are, actually, it's the same guy that was the linear algebra guy. He's he's innovating with a bunch of people with a new kind of thing to help the online stuff. So three blue, one brown. Yeah, but he's yeah. I've been again. I'll send you the link because it's some other people that were like way out there and they're kind of building tools to make that like how do you let people engage in Shira right at a larger scale and still feel they're dealing with Shira in just her garden. Um, I'll, it's a uh, uh, Interpol, I think. But anyway. I just want that 20 bucks an hour to sit at home and tell people, really, really, stay at home. You have to stay at home for 14 days. It's gonna, this is gonna be impossible. I think you could double it up, Mark, and while you're driving around in the golf cart looking for cracks in the airport runways, you could be doing contact tracing on the phone. You know, you could probably run two phones if you're good on mute. That's, that's not a bad idea. Yeah, you know, 40 an hour, you know, just change your name, get a fake ID, you're, you're set. Yeah, well, we'll see. I haven't gotten on a plane yet, but. <laughs> Casey, uh, do you wanna talk about something you mentioned earlier? Oh yeah, so I've been I, I've got the gardening project. I'll show that maybe next month when we finish it up. Um, but uh, something else I worked on here was a uh, I don't know if you guys can see it. It's black, but it it is a um, an epoxy based three D print that I made. Uh, took some ideas from Thingiverse and then modified it. But essentially, it mounts against your wall and then it holds your shoe up so you can spray sanitizer underneath it. Um, I know it's so ridiculous. I made like a hundred of them too. It's ridiculous. But you just put the shoe in and it holds it right up to the wall and you just spritz it and you're done. And all my kids leave all their stuff all over the floor, all over the house. And I'm sick of it. So I'm like, this is a fun game. Look at these things that are mounted on the wall. You just put your shoe in there and it's a little happy home for your shoe. The kids love it. So the shoes are all off the ground. Have so, you melted any shoes yet? We have not. No, <laughs> not yet. But, but no, it's just a 3D print and then some epoxy over it and then a couple coats of spray paint. So I don't know. That's just my... There's what my, age are your kids that they enjoy this? Uh, I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Okay, that explains a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no, eight, eight, 18 and 22, Nick. <laughs> uh, but uh, another news, uh, other news, too, um, we're doing a lot of shelter outreach with my dad's business right now. And um, you cannot get a puppy anywhere in the country. They're all gone. All of them. Total run on puppies. So if you're looking for a dog, good luck. <laughs> Same is true with bikes. Mm -hmm. It's wild. What were the other things that sold out? I noticed chickens at one point, uh, seeds, yeast, Nintendo DS, and uh, exercise equipment, right? Switch has been gone for months. They're just now back in stock. There's been plenty of yeah. jokes about the environment is restoring itself with the pallet of switches. Yeah, it took me a while to get a Nintendo Switch. The first in March. So, yes. Yeah, Matt, do you... Do you know, uh, so we're, I'm going to be totally naive here, but is yeast like cultivated in giant tanks and then dried and distributed or like, what's the, I, don't know. I, I have no idea. Form, right? Those little, those little like bean things. Yeah. It's, I don't know. But it there's, clearly. There's baker's yeast, it comes like in a flaky cake. And then there's like that dried instant yeast, which has like food mixed into it. Um, it must be a how it's made on that. That'd be cool. It probably has a YouTube video. But yeah, that was, that was short, but weirdly. So I'm not a baker, but for some reason I got interested in that. And Jennifer street market has some sort of weird secret back channel and mafia source. So they had like five pound bricks of yeast that were available the whole time, but only there. It's probably just like tailings from the ice cream factory. Like, oh, you know, if you leave these outside long enough, yeah. yeast kind of spawns. So. Right. <laughs> scrape it off the ground and put it in the brick. <laughs> wouldn't surprise me at all leave enough chef's ice cream buckets laying around on your set or whoever bought them cool that's so casey what kind of epoxy were you coating is it just like run-of-the-mill 
Harbor Freight Jeep epoxy you're brushing on or how are you getting that coating on there? Uh, that's that, that stuff that I think I posted last time, that uh, Raka epoxy. Oh, okay. It's the fancy oh. stuff you were raving about. It works really well. I'm telling you, it's nice stuff. Nice stuff. And you epoxy it just for strength? I did it for uh, strength and sealing because the, the plastic I'm using will uptake water and eventually become brittle. So I'm, uh, those, those will be there when I'm gone, hopefully. Hopefully. Casey, could you spell it? Sure asked. How, uh, it? Or I think it's R-A-K, Raka, I think that's right. Yeah, let me take a quick look. So the, I was actually doing an epoxy project. Casey, you'd be proud of me. It's, uh, it's epoxy concrete. Because if you try to buy epoxy concrete, it's super expensive. Uh, of course, I'm sure everybody knows that. It's like a bajillion dollars for a, a little pint of it or something. And so I instead uh, bought Menard's glaze coat, which is not to be used for flooring, apparently, because it's slippery as hell. And then I did a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one mix of uh, grout, because uh, it's not expanding, and then uh, sand and epoxy. And I use that to level our thresholds for the front door. So I got the front door threshold down finally. And uh, it's a very interesting consistency because it's like really chunky and weird to work with. But when you lay it down, the epoxy kind of flattens out and levels out. And I got done gluing it down and there's a couple of little rocks that were sitting proud. So I was just going to take a chisel and pop the rocks out. And uh, I tapped the rock and it just sheared the rock in half before we let go of the epoxy. So it was really impressive. The epoxy just hung onto the rock like mad and it would rather shear the rock regardless of the orientation than let the epoxy let go of the rock. So what, I had what, to, what is the like work time for that epoxy? Is it like a five minute epoxy? No, it's like 45 minutes because it's that glaze okay. coat, like the bar top glaze coat. So okay. like you're meant to pour it out on a, on a tabletop and then hit it with a, a heat gun or something like that. So, um, but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, it, it, works fine it's not super uv stable it says not to put in direct sunlight but in this case i literally just stuffed it full of sand so there is no exposed epoxy it's all hidden underneath sand because i didn't want it to be slippery at all because it's coming in on the door there's not a lot that's exposed but it's still uh, not good to have an edge there that's slippery um which davy you might know this davy is there uh there's different kind of tile for floor versus walls right oh you're muted Davey's muted. The phrase of 2020. <laughs> it has to do with the coefficient of friction. And if I remember right, it was uh, anything above 0.4 was good for a floor. And like the subway tile we're putting on the wall was like 0.01 or something like, you know, or I might have that backwards. It was like eight months ago when we were talking about all this. I was just curious. I, I know in the, the church that Heather and I stay at, um, somebody had redone this tile around a bathtub. And when they did that, they put up a bunch of wall tiles and then did like kind of a shelf by the bathtub and that kind of stuff. And then I'm pretty positive they took the same tiling and they did the floor right in front of the bathtub. And so uh, I have definitely landed on the ass trying to grab the towel that's on the rack right above the bathtub. Uh, because the floor is, was ungodly slippery. And I, I was curious. I didn't actually know whether I'm, I, but I was assuming that they had different types of textures for tiling. Uh, cause it's yeah. Really and it also slippery. has to do with, it also has to do with your grout lines. Cause if you have a very small tile, then you've got a lot of grout exposed. And so your coefficient of friction can be, uh, lower on a smaller tile. But if you have like a 12 foot or 12 inch square tile with only tiny little grout lines, then you need a higher coefficient of friction so that you don't slip around. Yeah, these are like four inch or three inch tiles. Like they're big and they're yeah. really, really slippery. And it was uh, probably done by, from, by someone from Home Depot that just like stuck them in there. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Cool. Uh, anybody else got anything they want to share? Otherwise, I think that's it for, oh man, Matt's yeah. got- Matt, the your yeah. cat is adorable. <laughs> Ours is uh, oh, up on the table now. She abandoned ship moments ago. Can't you envy now? Mine is at uh, Tufts Veterinary School trying very hard to find out where the problems are. That's just for Sarah. As the mayor mentioned, what phase like uh, recycling sessions at Sector 67 can resume at? Uh, well, legally we could be open right now. 
the the biggest issue that I've seen is that the data just do not support opening. The trending is upwards. Uh, we're I think we have more cases than we had a month ago, uh, and that might not be right, but definitely a positive coefficient of gain. Um, the argument can be made that we're uh, um, you know just testing more people, but I, until we have a random screening system whereby we're literally just assigning people to say you must go get tested as part of the random screening to understand what percentage of people are actually infected. Uh, and then the, the latest thing out of Wuhan where they did the entire city, they tested the whole city and found 300 people who were asymptomatic carriers um, out of like 9 million or whatever it was. But I just, we're not even, we're not even to the point of catching anybody who's an asymptomatic carrier at this point, unless it's just random chance that somebody's getting tested. Um, so I, I'm waiting to see at least another couple of weeks here to see what happens. And my guess is that it's going to go up. I don't, I don't think the protests are helping anything either, uh, especially pulling in the National Guard, who it's not like they're Madison National Guard. These are people from all over the city that you're now bringing into the city, exposing to people here. And then you're going to send them all home to rural communities all over the place. Uh, we're just not we're not really taking advantage of the opportunities that we have to, to get ahead of this thing. Um, and I don't think anything's going to change on uh, that. The real near future. Uh, I am working on trying to mitigate here to, so I can get the wood shop open back up again because I believe I can generate negative pressure on that quarter of the building and uh, we could do some clever things to to make that part work and make sure that you know individuals can work there or whatever without uh, exposing the rest of the building. Uh, but the only real positive news we've had is that uh, contact is uh, an unlikely way to get infected at least the studies that I've looked at are basically saying it's definitely a respiratory virus and it's transmitted through the air. It's not transmitted on surfaces uh, predominantly anyway. So that's good news, generally speaking, but it's bad news for trying to administer a building that's a big closed box and put people in it. That doesn't seem like a responsible thing to do. So, and I, again, I, you know, hopefully there's something that changes with summer, but we haven't seen that that changes at all with humidity or temperature don't seem to affect transmissions at all. Spread definitely does. There's a paper that came out today that shows um, through, I think, 142 uh, cross studies, they had demonstrated that wearing a mask really helps. And uh, regardless of the mask type, it's, it's beneficial. And that two meters does seem to be a good measurement. We've been doing six feet, so I think we're all screwed. We really got to bump it to two meters. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. So I'm, I'm doing what we can, but I, I don't, I feel it's an obligation to keep people safe and for better, for worse, uh, that falls under not promoting an environment that makes people sick. So got to. So for the sake of argument or the devil's advocate or whatever, yeah. uh, there's an ass load of windows in that building. And if, is there a, a value of air? Like how much air do we have to exchange per minute or hour to be safe or whatever? Yeah, I believe you need seven to 11 air turnovers. That's generally like a hospital standard. That's what we were shooting for when we built the intubation hood uh, for patient care. That was considered to mitigate um, the effects of having a patient who's uh, generating particulate. So the, the challenge is, is, yeah, we could open up all the windows, but it doesn't generate a flow. So it's not a controlled system. So yeah, you're turning over air, but you're not actually controlling the direction in which it's traveling. Because what you don't want to do is take the air from the person that you don't know is sick and transmit it through everyone else on the way out. And so that's the issue with like the offices is that everybody's nearby each other and there's no way to mitigate that distribution um, versus like the wood shop is its own space and it has its own negative pressure uh, as soon as I get the dust collector hooked up and running. So basically the, the guys there is that you run the dust collector full tilt, it's pulling 2400 CFM out of a room that has a known volume. And if we control where the inlet is into that room, we can make sure that anything that's in the room goes outside and the same thing for the welding shop. Um, but the rest of the space doesn't work that way because you don't have any way to control where the air is going. Uh, Jim was joking about, uh, we just build big polycarbonate desk boxes and that's your box. So we put an exhaust fan and a filter on the top of it and then you're good, you know? Um, they do make, uh, it's potassium permanganate uh, filters, and those are uh, ultra high oxygen. Uh, the, the potassium permanganate hangs on to extra oxygen and it lets them free. And so anything that makes contact with a potassium permanganate filter uh, gets totally murdered by uh, available oxygen. And so there's a company in town called Thermostore that makes a lot of humidifications and dehumidification solutions. And they have a 500 square foot um, air treatment system 
but if you scale up to like building size air treatment systems, we're talking like a UV chamber, the size of the, the machine shop to be able to treat the air that's moving through. Um, or you need these huge replaceable filters that are really expensive um, to be able to, to mitigate that. So, and if you've gotten a, ever gotten a hospital bill for like an ICU unit, part of what you're paying for is them swapping the filters on your unit uh, to maintain patient health because each one of those units is isolated. And that's the essentially the proposal is you have to make sure that your things stay isolated. So, um, and this is all contingent on the understanding that it's respiratory transmitted. There are some people who will carry it who are not going to show any signs of sickness. So it's not like you can measure everybody's temperature at the door or anything. That's it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything at all. Um, so there's not a good way to to kind of reconcile those things. So, yeah, I don't know. Not a an easy thing. I did see today the, uh, is it Pfizer? Somebody said October was their target date, uh, which I'm sure everybody's going to use to rally their stock numbers. Anybody working on a vaccine is going to go, oh yeah, we're shooting for October. We're shooting for October. Let's pump the stock numbers up. We'll have all the executives dump some stock in the market. And then uh, when October swings around and nothing's there to show, nobody will remember what the promise date was anyway. So um, that's just me being a uh, uh, I guess prodding Casey along. He's smiling away over there, Mr. Stockman. Um, anyway, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I think we got to wait and wait out a bit more data and see kind of what happens because it's uh, um, not going to be super fun. Matt, what's uh, what's blowing up downtown? I just saw your chat. It's, it's rainy. Oh, it's, it's raining. raining. Oh, that's good. It's feeling rainy. Nice. You were talking about like the mobile maker space. And That's available that. and open if anybody wants to come play. I don't care. Um, yeah. There's a uh, mill, a lathe, a bandsaw, a bunch of drill presses, uh, shear. Um, I can pretty much bring out whatever outside, whether it's a MIG welder or whatever else you want to play with. Big things are uh, not going to be doing a lot of like grinding and abrasive saw cutting outside to avoid pissing off the neighbors. They don't want to listen to uh, table saw running or anything like that. So uh, that's why I'm trying to get the wood shop up and working because I think I'll satiate quite a bit of interest uh, there. And then the trailer uh, can do well for a lot of the other needs um, for drilling holes and things and making parts. So yeah, if anybody wants to come use the trailer, let me know. I can open it all up and um, it's easy to use. And that that's basically outdoors because the, the two, actually there's three huge doors in the trailer. And by the time you're done opening all the doors, there's really not a lot of trailer left versus open space so um that works out pretty uh, good. did you say you wanted some camera in there as well too yeah a camera would be handy uh so that i can make sure someone's not bleeding to death in the right. you know, I, have two. I can i can bring them uh, over and hook them up and you have some kind of like reservation system yeah right? i think i mean right now the reservation system is shoot me an email and i'll open the doors for you um but i just meant if if there are enough people where needed then yeah we got to do a shared spreadsheet or a calendar app or whatever you want to do um just to keep track of that which would be handy when the wood shop rolls around because i'm sure that's going to be the same issue of scheduling time and figuring out what's what's good to do um the wood shop ostensibly if that exhaust is running you just need to wait out however many air turnovers and then you should be in good shape for whoever wants to come next uh, and we'll just use the back door but anybody else got any uh positive news to share Anything good in the world? Nothing. Nothing. All right. Forget. I, got, it. <laughs> I had to find the unmute button. Uh, like two months ago, I showed you guys that sign I made. Yeah. And we're on town. Huh? You're on Reddit. Yeah, I think Chris is your man. I so that's what I want to. I would just. This is my opportunity to gloat. There hasn't been a sunny day yet where somebody didn't stop and take a picture of that sign and send it to their cousin or their Facebook or whatever. And uh, just as an artist, that makes me happy. Like I've, I usually do stuff for like my wife or for myself or for whatever. I don't really do anything on display. And so that's been kind of fun just to watch the, um, you know, the energy behind it. And I have no social media, so I don't know like, what's going on with it. I definitely saw you on reddit.com slash r slash Madison WI. I thought I saw the same sign somewhere else in town. I'm, I'm I've seen a someone has made that sign. I've seen it like a small one, like a yard sign. Yep. So you maybe is the start of a cottage industry. I didn't start anything. I found this picture. I found a bumper sticker that somebody made on Reddit like a year ago. Oh. And that guy started this. 
And then I just saved that picture. And then when I got pissed off at dipshit for not doing anything about the virus, then I made the sign. And so like these have all kind of been in the works and it's just, we have this like hotbed of energy on it now. That's uh, President Dipshit, I believe. <laughs> Oh, nice. Plasma cuts? Yeah, I was looking for my mute button. How, Google, come on. It's a picture. Make it, make it high resolution. What do we got going on here? Oh, so oh, there we go. So yeah, I've been, uh, Davey, same, same idea. Uh, you know, the closet artists here are coming out in the pandemic. <laughs> um, yeah, I was uh, bored and looking to play around with the plasma cutter. And, and essentially, every time I've been cutting anything, I had to make a bunch of these, uh, uh, door guards for Kate out of aluminum and I realized the aluminum's actually got really good resolution so I made peach and a, a couple other cool things chopped out of that um, but yeah the owl went out the other day and then yesterday I put out the dragon there's a dragon that's like two feet tall like a big sea serpent uh, coming out of the garden so yeah it's been the same kind of thing I definitely have been uh, giggling while people either walk by and uh, totally oblivious to everything the dragon's really hard to miss so I think that'll get people to look in the garden a little bit more but uh there's a bunch of mario stuff and so that's been kind of funny to see uh people checking out the the mushrooms and whatnot sarah stole one of my uh uh, uh red ones but she has not come to get a green one-up mushroom or one of the little tiny blue ones uh and i'm i'm told there's a red mushroom or not a red mushroom i forget what the hell the other one is purple mushroom says heather um at any rate so i got to get the rest of my uh my last mushrooms uh figured out but Blue ones are the ones that make you micro, right? So you can go yes. in the time. Yeah. And the blue ones are appropriately undersized relative to the red and green ones. So <laughs> mainly because I didn't have room on the sheet. It worked out well. But uh, yes, the blue ones are properly scaled, apparently. Um, the neighbor kid around the corner is reading, reading about Greek uh, gods and Greek mythology. And I asked him what his favorite god was. And he said Poseidon. So now I got to make a big trident, angry looking Poseidon guy and put him out there. Because I've got another blue sheet. Uh, these were robbed from the university, the uh, UW loading dock. Uh, I was over there dropping some stuff off for the uh, engineers, engineering team that we're working with. And uh, I still go and poke at the loading dock to see if there's anything useful. And mainly this time I was looking for old uh, steel panels that we could chop up. So I found some big blue sheets that I uh, threw into the back of the van to borrow. I'm, I will return them someday to the UW. You know, no doubt they'll get their metal back. But uh, yeah, so I had some fun chopping that stuff up. Jared, did you get that link? Uh, Raka, yeah, yeah, I did. I checked right, out the, cool. the epoxy page. Very good. Thank you. So what is epoxy versus glue or poly or like what, why do we say epoxy is just opposed to glue or finish or, yeah. I know I can look that up on Wikipedia, but I'm lazy, so. Get Casey. No clue. So, uh, Polyurethane is generally used on wood and like Gorilla Glue, the, the stuff that foams, that's polyurethane. Uh, and so some polyurethane has to be, it, you can make it foam on purpose or you can make it not foam. And that's also like expand to foam is literally polyurethane. So it's two parts that mix together. Uh, there are other ones that are one part that you can get. Epoxy is two part material that you're mixing together, usually one to one uh, by volume. Uh, and then it's turning into a really hard shell. Um, as is it a, to like, oh, yeah. is it a list the one part epoxy. What's that? List the one part epoxy. Oh, I'm not, I don't, there's one part polyurethane, but there's not one part epoxy that I'm aware uh, of. Okay, all right. That's, That's what I'm right. yes. So I think though that like the nomenclature um, that you're saying makes a ton of sense. I think originally, the, uh, according to Wikipedia, it seems like the word epoxy <laughs> is coming from a chemical epoxide, but I doubt that that is a strict nomenclature nowadays. Yeah, and that's the same premise with polyurethane. Um, I think it's the molecular structure, of course, there. But any uh, any other, it's just like super glue. There's cryonolite, but then you've got uh, vet bond and derma bond are the cryonolite for skin. And if you look at those, the it's literally playing with a polymer ring and changing the uh, um, the uh, ring structure to make it whether it uh, messes with your tissue or not to make it burn literally a sting i of course cheap ass me was looking up to find out like can i buy dermabond 
as something else that's not Dermabon, it would be cheaper. And uh, it, it's not, nope, can't do it. Regular super glue will, will always sting if you put it on a cut, if it gets on you. It won't hurt you, but it makes it just stings. Uh, that versus, answers a question I have, because they sell uh, the cat cat claw covers, uh, and my cats would bully any other cat. So I, I've been super gluing, right, with the included super glue, which says it's special. And I was like, is it special, though? The little covers. And I guess it is special. Yeah, if you look up Vet Bond, Vet Bond is the veterinarian version of Dermabond, and Vet Bond does not sting, and it's a tenth of the price of Dermabond. So yes, I have bought Vet Bond. It works great, and it does not sting. And I imagine that's what's in your special super glue container for the cats. So if you ever get cut, you can use your cat's uh, glue to glue your flesh back together again. Be good for you. So there's nothing yeah. special about epoxy. It's a kind of plastic that can is very b sticky and likes to bind to things and then get hard yeah it's really good at bonding to tons of surfaces um and that's really the benefit to it it does not do well against really slippery stuff like it will not stick to hdp at all in fact in machining stuff if you've got a two-sided hdp object you uh, machine one side and make a well and you literally just pour epoxy in and you fill the whole well with epoxy and you flip your part over and you machine the other side and you'll be left with your part floating in epoxy. And then when you're done, you just hit the epoxy on something and the epoxy shatters and HDP is happy and everything's good. Um, so that's, it's not a good bonder to stuff like that. But then there's other glues that do well um, against HDP and UHMWP and stuff like that. And that's more of the polyurethanes are better in that regard. And that's where 3M makes all their money is making all these weird adhesives that can stick to weird things uh, that they can then charge you a lot for. Uh, glass is one thing that's a pain usually to get stuff to stick to. Hence in the aquarium world, all the aquarium people have their own uh, choices for special silicone and special glues and stuff like that that do well. And also don't kill fish is the other one. Matt, I feel like you need like six more cat cameras. I think Sarah could watch for hours. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I request one a perspective from the cat on the cat's collar yeah we uh we couldn't figure out how a way to charge tesla daily we had definitely discussed putting a, a cat collar camera on her but cool well thanks everybody for hanging out uh like i said i'll be poking at things in the wood shop um i should give a shout out to uh, david nelson and uh davy and uh scott and luke and levi's boys for uh digging some doing some footing work on the south side of the building. We've got two footings dug and formed, and we've got another footing dug from Jaden uh, and need to get that one formed before all the water tonight probably washes it back in again. And then uh, we've got one more footing to dig. If we get four of them formed, I can call a concrete truck and we can get that uh, poured. If you ever want to buy like the cheapest thing you can buy, concrete is amazingly inexpensive for how much mass you get. It's crazy. Um, but at any rate, um, that's sort of the, the thing to do. And then Sean gave me a hand yesterday. We carried one of the 30 foot long trusses around the building, uh, realizing roughly halfway through it that it was a piss poor idea to carry a 30 foot long piece of steel around the building as it gets really heavy about halfway there. Um, but at any rate, we put one truss on the north side that needs to get uh, essentially just wire brushed by hand and then wiped down with uh, phosphoric acid to, to treat the rust that's there and then painted. So if anybody wants to hang out in the shade uh, or in the sun, I suppose, uh, you can. Uh, give a hand with that. We've got, I think, eight of them to do. Uh, and that'll let us get working on uh, um, getting the deck portions painted and treated and ready to, to hang up and, and build. So that'll be pretty cool. Hopefully not as involved as, as Davey's uh, bathroom rebuild, but maybe it will be. Uh, I'm planning Thursday evening to come dig a hole, by the way. Awesome. Be what cool. are the 30 foot trusses for? I, I think I saw the email, but I forgot. Yeah, so if you take a look at the email I sent out, uh, the building plans, we're going to build a 130 foot long deck along the south side of the building that'll be elevated at the second floor height. So it'll be about 14 feet in the air or a little bit taller. Um, and then the trusses we got for free from Findorf. Uh, and then Brian Bussey did all the design to figure out how to space the trusses to avoid the windows and doors and things along the south side. So we've got kind of this hodgepodge of trusses that we sort of space to not really interfere with things. Um, and then the deck's about eight feet deep. So it'll be eight feet by 130 feet long, uh, which is pretty cool all the way along the south side. And then 
at each one of the verticals, we're going to put solar panels on it. Um, we couldn't do them above the deck because the trusses don't have enough weight capacity. So the humans on the deck are too much weight uh, relative to uh, adding solar. So we would have had to double the trusses, which is a whole bunch more work. So the, the vertical columns, though, don't care about more load and more twisting uh, forces from the panel. So, so it should be pretty cool uh, ability to do that. It is uh, really windy out. Hmm. It's interesting. Our HVAC system is buzzing because it's uh, trying to offload pressure from inside the building to outside the building and the garage door is flying back and forth. So anyway, that'll be fun. Um, but yeah, if you take a look at the building plans, you get a better sense of what those trusses are for. But that's uh, uh, the next step is to get them back into reasonable conditions so we can reuse them and then I can start building uprights and putting stuff together. I'm so excited to come visit after all the hard work is done. <laughs> Your shovel's still there, Shara. Yeah, your shovel's kicking ass, Shara. That orange thing oh. is uh, is pretty fun. I've acquired a couple more shovels since I I keep finding them. Like nobody seems to keep their shovels. Yeah, with these pesky uh, college students move out, you know, they just dump their shovels here. It was it was an interesting thing. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, we'll. Uh, Catch you next month of the latest, but like I said, if there's something that you want to hang out and do out in the trailer, you're more than welcome to come by, um, and uh, I can sort of show you the ropes and set you loose. Um, there's uh, plenty of things to do with the tools that are there. It's just a matter of figuring out a project that is appropriate to what's present. Otherwise, if you need something cut out or whatever else, let me know. I'm happy to help with whatever you want to do or whatever you need to do. That's sort of the uh, the, the exchange obligation is the in in order to protect yourselves from yourselves. Uh, I am willing to do whatever it is that you want me to do to help you do that. So I, I don't care. It's not that I'm sitting here on my hands board or anything, but in the same sense, it's not hard for me to set up or make stuff or build stuff for you. So I don't mind doing it. I know it's not the same, but it's also not getting virus all over the place, which is good too. <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.